working with the Atlantic Puffin, as you can see, this is a series of totally wild webinars. And the idea is to focus it in and hopefully exciting and thrilling so that everyone can play with it as we run a series, first of all, this one around the Hinterlands Who's Who series of items and animals and flora and fauna that we're working with. We also run numerous webinars all the time. So all you have to do is quick, quickly check our calendar and you will get all the information on these sessions. So without further ado, we're going to start with the Atlantic Puffin, an incredible bird that we work with. And my name is Randy McLeod. I am the Education Manager with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And I am working in the education system all across the country so people can contact me whenever they want. So here we go, the Atlantic Puffin. What a marvelous looking bird, wonderful creature. Again, it is called the Atlantic Puffin for a very simple reason. It is located in the Atlantic area. It is located basically on the east coast of Canada, possibly down as far as New York and sometimes a little further. But again, marvelous little bird as you start looking at its features. We have a uh, various description. What you normally will look at for the Atlantic Puffin. Whoops, something is just playing a little crazier for me. Give me a second as we start to work with it. Okay, so what we're normally working with is the breeding period description of the Atlantic Puffin. This is what it normally looks like that we see all the time. This bright, colorful bird that just is a fantastic little creature that works. Very stocky in the head. It has a wonderful looking tuxedo style outfit to it with the black back and the white breast to it. And nicely orange legs as opposed to the ready orange in the bill that we're looking at as well. They are sort of you know, penguin-like coloring. If you look at it, that's where the black and white comes from. They've been quite often referred to as a sea parrot because of the way they fly, the way they chatter, and what they work with. Puffins are really one of the uh, abnormalities here is that they quite often return to the exact same area, which is not abnormal for most uh, birds at all, but what they do is these puffins not only return to the same colony, approximately the same breeding area, as well as the exact same partner for years and years and years. So they become mates almost for life, even though when they leave the breeding area, they head off onto their own. They are pretty much on their own until it becomes back into time to work with breeding. So what happens is after breeding, though, this is where we run into a really important point about the Atlantic Puffin. The Atlantic Puffin now goes through a complete metamorphosis. And what happens is it starts to shed many of those incredible features that we've seen. And so what we're going to look at is a shedding. We've got the breeding one on the left and the non-breeding. As you can start to see, there are major differences. These major differences are simple. They lose their colorful around the bills and eyes. You know that wonderful red color on the end of the whiteness to it. It sheds a lot of its head feathers and around its neck. So the head goes from this bulkiness down to a slim feature. Almost like we've gone on a diet and they've started to shed the excess weight. It sheds excess feathers. It does all of this. As a matter of fact, not only does it do that, but the face even starts to change. The facial features start to change, so it recesses back. We start to get the, the bill feature of it. As you can see, the bill becomes a little more in depth. It's not as nicely smoothed out with the head. It also changes around the eye and the bill to a much darker coloration. That darker coloration is now into its non-breeding. Sometimes we refer to other animals with a winter coat and a summer coat. They work sort of that way, but it's more of a breeding and a non-breeding. Even though we know breeding is done in the summertime, 
non-breeding is usually in the winter time. So, so much so that people for the longest time thought we were dealing with two completely different kinds of puffins. And so they were quite often mistaken as the common mirrors, but again, it is the same puffin. So people thought that they had discovered a new species at one time because they looked completely different. So just the picture illustrations again to go over it, and you can easily see the differences in it. Habitat, these are seabirds. They spend almost all of their life on the sea, basically floating around and eating. They only come to land when it's time to breed from their scenario. They like resting on the water, swimming, sort of like a duck with their feet. They do wonderful things out there. And as we keep going, they work with it. Now, not only are they doing that, but they use their wings to stroke underwater, which is a little bit of an, an anomaly around this because most birds just point and dive straight down and then attempt to come back up. Well, what happens with the puffin is they turn, point, go down, and then use their wings to try and get down to the depth where they want to work from. We know that a lot of birds come from the air and dive into the water, so they have that propulsion or speed to work their way down and through. And since they've got that propulsion, they don't use their wings that often. They become very aerodynamic. Well, the puffin is a little bit of a difference here. They like to swim on the water, and then once they figure out where it's time to go, they then turn, point, head down, and like to use their wings to swim. They've been located down to depth 60 meters. Like for those of us looking, like 60 meters is a long, long distance. And they usually can stay underwater for up to half a minute, which illustrates that their lung capacity for such a small bird is actually quite good. Puffins, you can see them quite often. They nest in colonies all over the place. Uh, colonies can be as large as 100,000, 500,000 nests in an area. And they like to put their nest in an area a little outside of where their predators would usually find them. And predators are usually from the land, foxes, mink, very small animals that would prey on them. From the air, though, they've got another scenario. They've got other ones like gulls and that that like to come over and create problem and eat the young and the nest, bother the nest for the eggs. So what ends up happening is they usually select a nice little area out of the way and on a grassy slope, they try and ding themselves a little burrow with their feet, bill, wings, etc. And that burrow is usually about 50 to 200 centimeters long or in most cases, if you take a look at it, is about the depth of a meter stick, where they then turn around, line the nest to make it nice and friendly and cuddly and fun, and they line it all up with grass and twigs and feathers and things that are around, because what the breeding female is going to do then is lay a single egg into that nest. Puffins are not like other birds where they will lay two, three, four, five eggs and then it becomes sort of like survival of the fittest. Puffins believe that their one single chick is actually the fittest and therefore will work with it. So the egg that is laid is about 14% of the body weight of the puffin itself. Now that's one seventh of their entire size is located in one egg. That is just an unbelievable task. So you could understand why if we're laying eggs that are this large, why only one egg would probably work the purpose because it would be a little awkward to have more than one. They start on a nice white shape from coloring with small little yellow spots on it. But because these birds live on the water and go back and forth all the time on the water, they end up landing in these little rocky places so they start to pick up a little bit of mud and dirt and other grass on it so when they come to sit and to sit on the egg what happens is all of that dirt then brushes off gets ground into the shell a little bit so of course we know they're going to be dirty and mud colored both parents take total pride in this they both take their turns on the nest while one's feeding one is sitting and then vice versa. And then finally when the chick hatches, which comes out in this beautiful soft down, 
a little gray black on the head etc then the real fun begins because now it's time for mom and dad to get out on the water and to start nurturing and feeding this wonderful little chick that they've got and they do that by bringing back small fish small crustaceans and various things that they pick up in the water so they swim on the surface like a duck again if we remember that part they're swimming along they then figure out where they want to go dive down use their wings and feet to propel them through as they start looking for little tiny fish like herons and capelin and little sand eels which are very neat to find as well when those are not plentiful which at times they will not be they start looking for the little crustaceans the little tiny squid and so forth so while hunting the interesting part about the puffin is they don't like to go back and forth a number of times so what they're doing is while they're under the water they're trying to capture as many of these little fish in that that they can in that 20 to 30 second period that they're under so they'll flip one up into their bill and then the bill is lined with a series of very sharp spines point in a backward direction so as they catch a little fish it's locked in <clears throat> pardon me as they then open their mouth for the next little fish the first one is already locked in place with the teeth the next one comes falls in front and so forth the process keeps going so that they can collect as many as they can in a very short time period that they're working and this is a picture illustrating how it works <clears throat> So when you start looking, you can see they fill from the back to the front. Now, of course, we're going to know from this picture that this, is it a breeding or a non-breeding description? Because the bill has that beautiful color, the eye has the color, the face is not darkening. This is during the breeding period. Okay, so since it's during the breeding period and we're collecting this many fish, they're collecting it to take back to the nest for the feedings. And as you can see here, these little rascals that are in the nest become very hungry because they have to be fed four to ten times a day. That's a lot of feeding. So each parent probably is in and out five times a day dealing with this. So as you can see, 10 grams of food doesn't sound like a whole big bunch, but remember the body weight of that new chick. The new chick doesn't weigh a whole big bunch, so 10 grams is an awful lot of food going in sort of like a fattening period as they grow and they grow quite rapidly puffins there are about 12 million breeding puffins in the world which means about 24 million in total but we have immature and mature so there are more than 24 million puffins in the world just when we talk we're normally looking at the breeding ratio and since the breeding ratio is what helps move on this is why we keep our counts going. Uh, they have been spotted from the Scandinavian areas, Norway, Greenland, Iceland, into the eastern Canada, also into the states from Maine to the Arctic. Now think about that. They're located way up in the Arctic, which is very, very cold. But when you take a look at our numbers of puffins, these 24 million or 12 million breeding pairs, most of them are along north america and the bulk of that is located just around the coast meaning the east coast of newfoundland so there they are they come back into land they're here for about four months while they nurture and grow the young at that point there when it is time to leave they lose those beautiful colors remember they go back out to sea in their non-breeding description and then they spend the entire winter or about eight months of the year in the open North Atlantic and most of us know the North Atlantic is one very very cold location and so they have to stay well insulated and warm and these wonderful birds are set up that way so they're out there on the water they've even been spotted as far as the Canary Islands way over by Africa so when we start looking at the range this just gives you an idea of the range map now again small a little hard to see but the idea behind this one is on the left where we can show you their winter migration is that little blue all set up in striated lines showing you they're all over the water and if you look at the top left corner of that blue that's a way up on baffin island around the arctic circle 
Then if you start looking this summer, you can see a little darker blotches around in that left-hand one showing it to us. The right-hand map gives you a better idea of where they are, and it gives you numbers. So when you start looking around Newfoundland, you can see those bigger boxes which illustrate tens of thousands of Atlantic puffins, or just referred to as puffins, are out there in their breeding time with their mates. And again, remembering, mates are for life pretty much, so they're returning back to the same location each time. Now, what are some other cool and interesting facts about the Atlantic puffin? They can live to be 20 to 30 years old. That is a phenomenal age for these little birds. And they just keep going and going. Another nice interesting piece, in 1992, the Atlantic puffin, or again, the puffin, was selected to be the provincial bird of Newfoundland Labrador. Another wonderful thing for it. In the air, the puffin is surprising fleet by flapping their wings, and this is really interesting, 400 times a minute. Now, if you could flap your arms out on the side four times a minute, think how tired they would be. Oh, I know if I tried to do it, I probably wouldn't even make it to 40 times my arms would be tired. But again, when you look at this, the speed they can reach. They can reach speeds up to 88 kilometers an hour. So if you're with your parents at the car or you're driving yourself, that's almost the speed limit of a highway. Okay, which is incredibly fast and very agile. But with incredible airborne and speed comes this wonderful body. And unfortunately, landings are not always that perfect. They quite often will land still with a fair amount of speed and that speed then causes them to bounce around as they hit the land or a crash landing. It has been recorded that one of these little tiny puffins has held 61 of those small fish in its bill. Now the average for most of these is about 10 to 12, 10 to 14. So 61 must have been an incredible fishing day. I know if my father-in-law and my father were alive, catching 61 fish would be a phenomenal event. Now, the other thing is, with these incredible birds, they have to have a sound. The sound, though, is more like a growling. It doesn't seem to be that nice, pretty sound we expect from a gorgeously decorated bird. So it sounds more like a muffled chainsaw, which really gives it more of a growling sound. So... With that in mind, that gives us a little bit of a descriptor and how the Atlantic Puffin works, its pictures of it, its ranges, and so forth. I'm Randy McLeod, the Education Manager, so if you're looking for further information, you can see my email address and my phone number there. There's also a website that you can look into at our education site. On the other side, with Hinterlands Who's Who, our coordinator is Miss Annie Langlois, and you've got her contact information. And I have also listed there the site for HWW, or Hinterlands Who's Who, where you can find more information. As a matter of fact, there's about a five-page document out there on the Atlantic Puffin, which is all sitting there with great information because we didn't get into the ideas of the courtship that they go through when they're breeding, when they meet each other, how they do this, how they do that. We've just tried to give a general description and a general overview to give you some ideas around the Atlantic Puffin. So with that in mind, we're also going to be running a whole host of these. I'm going to be doing the English ones. Miss Annie Langlois will be doing the French ones. And so in September, we're going to start running every other month. So September is English. October will be French, November English, and so forth all the way through. And in September, we're going to go through a very simple series around the incredible orca, or as we know them by their other name, the killer whale. So with that in mind, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the screen. Please feel free to send me an email if you'd like for more information or anything else. And with that in mind, I'm going to sign off at this point, but I will be sticking around. And I'll be sticking around for about the next five or ten minutes here, not physically going through any more information or working with it. But if you have questions, answering them, or, in other words, basically playing around and having some more fun. So, hope you enjoyed. 
Look forward to seeing you again in September. Remember the orca, the killer whale. We're going to go now from the east coast out to the west coast. But we do know orcas are seen elsewhere that might be in an easterly direction. So we're going to play across the country. And like I say, the calendar will give you all the dates and times for all of these webinars around the hinterlands. Who's who? So enjoy your day. Hope it's been a good one so far. And we'll see you later on. Thank you very much.